Good morning, church. This morning's scripture reading will be from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 14 through 22. And the scripture reads, It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Well, it's great to see you guys. I'm excited that you're here to be able to worship God. You're all spread out and masked up and everything else trying to be safe. If only masks worked on sin, wouldn't that be great? I mean, that if it was only that simple. But I think there's more things that go on. If you notice in our day and time, there's a lot of people who see things differently. One person will say, oh, if you wear your mask, you're going to be safe. Everything's going to be fine. And that's all there is that you have to do. Other people see the problem differently. And they go, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't have to wear your mask. It's, a, it's all a hoax. It's all, you know, no one believes any of it anyway. We see the problem differently. And we see the solution differently. And I think there's a lot of times in history where we see different things that are happening for us. And so I think that's what happened at the crucifixion. The people saw something different than what Jesus was actually trying to do. Let's look at the crucifixion for a little bit today. John chapter 14 that uh, Matt has just read to us. It's the preparation for the Passover, and Pilate is trying to figure out what to do with Jesus. As he's talked with Jesus, he's come to the conclusion that Jesus is innocent, that there isn't any issue, there isn't any problem, that uh, Jesus, uh, he's fine. He's claimed to be king of the Jews. He's heard that he's king of the Jews. He's talked to him about that. For the Romans, that's not a problem. You can be king of your little country if you want. After all, we've conquered the world. And so we'll let you deal with all the little things going on here. And uh, it wasn't really a threat to the Romans at all. Pilate does not feel threatened by Jesus, and neither does Jesus try to threaten him in any way. And so that part's fine. And so he wants to release him, and you may recall the story about Barabbas and about how he's accustomed to releasing one person. And so he tries to release Barabbas, and, or release Jesus, and they say, no, we want Jesus to be crucified. Well, who am I going to release? Well, release Barabbas. He's a murderer. He's... A robber, he's one of those people who's caused all kinds of problems and dealt off the pain of others. And what do you want me to do with Jesus? It's like, well, I want you to crucify Jesus. And so they start shouting to crucify Jesus. And Pilate does not quite know what to do with all of this. He doesn't find any reason to crucify him. But the crowd just shouts all the more, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate's kind of amazed. He, he goes, well, shall I crucify your king? And they come back with the response, we don't have any king. We only take Caesar as our king. And Pilate's just kind of helpless to stop it at this point. 
And I want you to realize what they're saying is absolutely true. If you don't take Jesus as your king, then you don't have him as your king. They are absolutely right. Because we've got to accept Jesus as being our king. And so they have refused him and said, no, he's not. He is not our king. We have no place with him. We're not following him. We're not doing what he wants. And so Pilate doesn't have any, anything else he can do. He washes his hands and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Well, but then he sends him away to be crucified. And so it says they took Jesus out, and he is bearing his own cross to the place of the skull. Can you imagine having a place in town called the place of the skull? Uh, some of the pictures we see, it actually kind of resembles that. It's called Golgotha as well. But Jesus has trouble carrying his own cross, and so we find Simon is there to help him with this, to be able to carry the cross with him or for him as they go to the place where he is about to be crucified. He's not the only one. There are two thieves that are crucified with him, one on each side. And maybe this is just to show the company that he keeps. Maybe it's just a matter of, well, we've got three, we might as well do them all together. But uh, it may be the fact that we're going to place him right among the robbers, one on each side of him so that we can show where he belongs. And so it's a ridicule of Jesus that he, he's no better than a robber, and so we're going to put him right there with them. But one of the thieves seems to believe in Jesus. And so he says to Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. The other thief does not believe any of this. And so he asked Jesus, well, you know, if you can do something, if you are the son of God, get yourself down off the cross and take me with you. Because if you can get yourself off, you can get me off. And so you see them being able to do this and being able to ask these things. None of the, nobody's asking, is this right? Is it fair? Is it just? Uh, there's no concern about that. And so they crucify an innocent man. And Pilate puts up a sign above. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Written in three languages so that no one mistakes it. So that no one is able to say, oh, what did that sign say? It doesn't matter which language you speak. And they may have spoken a couple, if not all three of these the king of the Jews. And so there he is with a sign that says who he is. He is the king of the Jews. And perhaps Pilate believed that. Perhaps Pilate thought that. That I might as well put that. It's his claim anyway. But they begin to argue with the sign. And they say, no, don't put that he is the king of the Jews. Put down that he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate just refuses to change it. He says, you know, what I've... What I've written, I've written, and that's what the sign's going to say. To stand there looking at that situation with that sign, with Jesus and what he's doing as he dies on the cross, and the sign over him says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, it's right in their face. It is exactly what the truth is. And so many times we see the world differently. And we cannot accept what we see with our eyes. And even if they put a sign on it and said what it really was, we still couldn't accept it. We still couldn't believe it. And so they are watching the king of the Jews as he is dying for them, and they don't accept it. They're watching the king of the kingdom of heaven, as he dies for all of us. If you put up a sign, would it convince everybody? Doesn't that work? 
I mean, all we have to do is put up a sign, and then everybody believes the sign, right? Somehow not so much. And there's a response from the rest of the crowd in verse 39. It says, And those who were passed by derided him and wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. That's got to be hard when you are the King of the Jews, when you are the Son of God, when you are the Lord of glory. And here is all these people who are shouting against you. Wagging their heads. Have you ever done wagging? Uh, do we know how to do wagging? That's, I think we've seen it a lot. It's where you just go, oh no, this is not right. We're, we're probably even good at wagging. But it says that's what they're doing. They're looking at him and rather than praise and rather than the fact that they're, they're saying, well, he could be, he might be, we have hope. They're just going, oh no, he can't possibly have you ever done that at your kids? Go, oh, that one can't be mine. <laughs> Something like that. And so that's what they're doing. It's not a sense of praise. And so they're saying, you said destroy the temple in three days, and then you would build it again. And yeah, that's, we didn't see that happen, did we? And here you are on the cross. And so the chief priests and people come by to mock him. He saved others, he can't save himself. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He did save the thief, though, right in front of them. Because that's what he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because he expressed such faith in Jesus at such a hopeless time that, you know, when you come in your kingdom, remember me and... Well, that's an incredible amount of faith as he's watching another guy who's going to be dying right beside him. And he says, I still believe you're king. I still believe in your kingdom. I still believe all of this is going to happen. And Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now is their statement. If God desires him, let God deliver him now. And certainly we're going to see that happen. We like to jump on weakness. We like to test leaders. We like to see what they're made of. There seems to be a whole lot of concern here for saving himself. And maybe it's all just the way that we look at it. What happens when we show what he's capable of? And what happens when we're the ones who does it to him? He can't save himself. How can he save others? Maybe a legitimate question as you look at all of this. But to save himself from us, to save himself from the people he's trying to save, doesn't that seem just a little bit odd? In the way that they're doing this. That we would be the ones doing the torture. It reminds me of, you know, I have no experience with this. But if you watch TV, you watch how sometimes gangs have an initiation. And so they'll take one guy and they'll beat him really bad to, to prove that he's strong enough. Well, the gang's the one that did it. And okay, if you can take that, well then now we'll let you in and you belong with us. It's almost like that's what they're saying. You know, if we can just kill you enough and you come back and come down off the cross, then we'll believe in you and we'll declare you could do that. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm not doing that. Because it is my place on the cross that is what is going to be your salvation. And so he goes to the cross to give them a reason to believe. He goes to the cross in order that he might conquer the last enemy. 
And the last enemy is death. The difference is, we sometimes see salvation as avoidance. Certainly that's the way they're looking at this. If you could avoid being killed, then we would believe in you. Because that's the only place we see. That's the only thing we see that's possible. That, we don't see any other way out of this except avoidance. Isn't that the way we would look at it most of the time? It's the guy who has the gun. Don't shoot. Okay, how did you avoid that? Well, he didn't shoot. There's no bullet. There's no death. We avoided the death situation. Or somebody who has poison. Well, I didn't drink the poison, so there's no situation. I avoided the cause of death. Or if there's a disease, hmm, that might be very telling. And I avoided the situation by wearing a mask, by staying in, by staying home, by doing all this stuff. That's what I needed to do in order to avoid death. The boat that doesn't sink in the middle of the storm. And the storm passes by and I avoided Death. The scribes and the chief priests and the elders had planned to kill him. Because they believe that it will, it will bring about an end to his teaching, an end to his healing, an end to his influence. They think the only end is death. It all ends in death. Doesn't it? Or does it? Crucifixion is always shameful. Because they're criminals. That's why they're being crucified. And so it was always shameful. In the law, it's cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And it's this idea of punishment. And that it would be this capital punishment as a person who's crucified as a criminal. And Jesus changed all of that. If somebody put, points a gun at your head, we see people as we watch movies or TV, and they're all afraid, and they they oh, I'll do anything if you point the gun at me, right? Isn't that why you point the gun? And then they say, oh, well, I wasn't going to shoot. Well, then why were you pointing the gun? Well, I wanted to have power. It's just the threat. And so, therefore, you'll do it because the next step is death. Unless death isn't permanent. Unless death is not the problem. What if the creator is bigger than his creation? So they kill Jesus. And he gets up and goes home. He lets his disciples know that he's okay. More than okay. He rejoices in the fact that he's won. He defeats Satan. And now Jesus holds the power of death. Satan tried to condemn an innocent man, and that is not permissible. It's one of those amazing things that one person looks at it from one side, seeing the only way out of this situation is for you to come down on a cross and save yourself. And Jesus is the only way that makes sense in this situation is for me to die on a cross and save myself and you. It's two different ways of looking at it. Can we ever bring ourselves around to God's point of view? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, it explains it this way. He says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God 
who makes propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Since we are flesh and blood, he says, he became that as well. He came down to earth and he took of flesh and blood and he became human. It's a long way for him. It's a huge step from being where he was now down to being human. Satan held the power of death. No, I didn't suddenly get sick, but I'm (laughs) trying not to cough on myself or anybody else. I know you guys are a long way away, but... So Satan held the power of death, but Satan no longer holds the power of death. He held the power of death because every person sins and every person is not able to deliver himself and not able to get rid of his sin. We can't find forgiveness just on our own. And the end is we die and we're evil and there's no way out of that. We were Slaves, and the worst thing is death. We fear the penalty of death for one reason, because it's painful. For another reason, because we cannot get out of it until Jesus. And Satan no longer has the power of death because Jesus has conquered death. And that's what it describes here. The power of death is sin. I will. Thank you. Okay, that's better. (laughs) Satan no longer holds the power of death because the power of death is sin and the power of sin is the law as he describes in 1 Corinthians 15. And when Jesus comes and dies on the cross, he does away with the law and he does away and he becomes the sacrifice for sin and able to bring about forgiveness of sin. And so Jesus establishes a new kingdom by his cross, a kingdom that includes resurrection from death, which was not available before, and forgiveness of sin, which was now a different way because he's not under law. And so Jesus delivers from sin. Jesus delivers from death. He can forgive sin. He can give grace. Death is no longer the end. Resurrection and kingdom are. And so it's a different way to look at the problem. It's a whole different way to see it because Jesus is now the faithful high priest in the service of God. And he has come to be able to give his blood for the sins of the people that we might be able to have a place within. He became the curse that the law talks about, but he died and rose again. And death is not permanent. Because Jesus now brings about a death as a way to the next stage. As a way to eternal life. It's a means to an end. Death is now something we use. Death is something in the hand of Jesus, not in the hand of Satan anymore. And so we believe in a crucified king. We believe in a crucified king that is our savior. What a different way. He has died and shed his blood. And because he is on a cross, we have salvation. What an incredible thing he's done. And we worship him and give him praise and we give him honor. And that way we see Jesus crucified and that makes the difference. But what do we do about that? What a great thing Jesus did long ago. Well, Paul addresses that also in Romans chapter 6. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Do we continue in sin that... You know, what do we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do we not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
For we, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we certainly shall be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been freed from sin. That is such an amazing passage, and it has so much to say to us. Do we continue in sin that grace can increase? He says, no. Well, the other end of that is, so then what do we do? Do we just try to be better? We'll just try harder. We're not going to continue in sin, but we'll be good. We'll be good, right? I mean, we come every Sunday promising we'll be good, and then we go home and uh, Monday comes. And we don't do so well. And it doesn't get any better. That's because that's not the solution. It is not, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, or shall we try hard to not do it anymore? Jesus has the third option. You got to die. The only way this is ever going to make sense is you got to die. And the problem many times with our baptism is that no one died. We brought somebody and they believed, well, I should obey. And it says, I got to do this. And so I'm obeying. And there was no death that occurred. Because we didn't die to ourself and say, that person isn't alive anymore. He's not going to exist anymore. He's not going to live anymore. He's not going to think that way anymore. He's not going to say those things anymore. He cannot exist anymore and take up space in my life. He's got to go. We cannot have a baptism where no one died. We got to do it the way Jesus did. We can't just be trying to stop our old habits and our old sins and our old wants and our old desire. And sure enough, it'll work for a little while. And then it comes back twice as hard, doesn't it? The only way is the way Jesus did, not by simple avoidance, which is what we've done all the time. Try to be as good as we can so we can avoid death, avoid sin. You can't continue in sin and get grace. We can't stop sinning on our own. It takes death. And we have to go through it. And our old self, it says, was crucified with Christ. So that our body of sin might be defeated, done away with. We are no longer slaves to sin. We died to it. We didn't just try to quit. We died to it. And we died to be set free from sin. And when we died and when we repented and when we changed, we were buried. Buried by baptism into death. And it put us into his death, in connection with his death, in connection with his blood. The one who died is freed from sin to walk a new life. But what happens then? Is it just, okay, we're free, now we can do whatever we want. No, that's really not going to be what's best for us. We're free to serve a new king. And it brings us right back to Jesus who died on the cross to form a new kingdom that we might be part of that new kingdom. Paul in Colossians puts it this way. For he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We are able to find redemption and forgiveness in Jesus because we are all part of his kingdom. And that's the way it works. We preach Christ crucified with no shame. How can you talk about your leader that died? Are you kidding? Yeah, our leader died. Our leader gave himself up for us. And our king has been crucified and our king reigns and he has authority and power. And he rose from the dead and he will take us with him. We are not avoiding the cause of death. We use it to deal with our past. We use it because we 
have been crucified with Christ. At least that's what I hope for you. Have you done that yet? Have you been crucified with Christ? Have you decided that I need to get away from this sin? And so you have died to your sin, died to that old self, and allowed yourself to be raised new in Christ, baptized into him, buried, and now raised to walk this new life in this new kingdom, transferred out of darkness, transferred into a kingdom of light. Dead to old desires. Because that person no longer exists. He's gone. It's like what the Jews had said to Jesus. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. And I want you to know that statement is still true. If you trust in God, God can deliver you now. Because he does desire you. He does want you, and God does deliver and forgive and love because he desires us as we serve a crucified king. Today, I'm asking you to be able to do that, to make sure of your past, to deal with it, to look at all the things that are going around and perhaps see the world in a different way, that we serve a crucified king who allows us to live a new life. If we're able to help you with that, Come, let us pray with you. Come, let us talk to you. Come, let us baptize you into Christ. Thank you for watching our video. We have a lot more content here on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to get the latest notifications when we have new material come out, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.